the dado. One of the most fundamental joints in woodworking. And today, I wanna to show you how to cut three variations. Number one, the full width dado, which is a fantastic way to cut dados for beginners. Number two, and kind of intermediate version of that, the stopped dado, which is a fantastic way to elevate a very simple but very important joint. And number three, the shoulder dado, which is kind of the advanced version of this joint and the one that I employ the most. Now, as a wrinkle, I'm gonna show you how to do all three of those by hand without any power tools whatsoever because it's just one of those days. So grab a coffee, turn off the music, cozy up on the couch, your computer chair, wherever you're watching this video, and let's do a little woodworking, but like old school. It is a glorious spring day here. The sun is shining, the birds are chirping, everybody's in a good mood. It's that time of year that makes you go for a walk in the morning, take in a little sunshine and, and just reflect on things. And I was doing that this morning and I was thinking about the video I made last week. This little shelf right here that I made for an award I won recently. And I had this desire to remake it cutting those joints by hand, which I'm not gonna do because you've already seen me build it once and there's no reason for me to make that piece again. But what I do think might be valuable is going through the process of cutting that joint, a dado, by hand in a few different ways. Because number one, this is the time of year where the windows are open and the breeze is coming in and you just kind of want to have a quiet moment and cut some joints by hand. But also I recognize that some people don't have the necessary tooling or the space to have that tooling to cut joinery by machine. So how do you cut a dado by hand? Here's what we've got. The first joint, the easiest joint to cut, is gonna be a full width dado. And what that means is, the dado itself is going to be the full width of the board, but it's also going to be the full length of the board. Huh? The full thickness of the board and the full width of the board. Strike that, reverse it. That means there's no shoulders on this piece. All we have to do is remove material out of the negative piece or the female piece in order for this to fit in there. Very simple operation and all we really need is four tools. Number one, we're gonna use a saw for this one. Whatever saw you got lying around, hopefully it's small enough that it's easy to use. This is just a dovetail saw from Veritas. I've got a chisel. Now you only really need a chisel, but if you have two chisels, one that's less wide than the width of your dado and one that's a little bit wider that you can use as a registration. That's always helpful, but you don't need it. You only need one. We need a square, of course, whether you have a nice fancy combo square or just a framer square, both will work. Speed square, framer square, whatever square you got, help make a square. It doesn't actually matter. And then you need a knife. Now, this is a fancy knife. You do not need this kind of flat back dual bevel knife. All you need is this bad boy. I am so accustomed to using this. I use this knife on probably 99% of my furniture. Very rarely do I break this out to the point where most of the time I forget that I have it. So I'm gonna use this maybe later on in the video, but for right now we're gonna use this because it's what I know, it's what I have, and it's cheap and accessible. So that's where we're at on that. Now, let's get this set up so we can cut some joinery. So to give you some context of what I'm working with here, so you don't think you need to go out and spend five grand on a new bench and a bunch of hardware and a tail vise and all these other things. All I have here is, tighten that down pretty good. <sighs> what I've got here is a homemade bench dog that fits into these bench holes. 
that can butt up against it. And then on this side, that also fits in my bench holes, I've got this thing from Veritas, which is essentially a tail vise that just slips in a hole. And guys, I love this thing. I'm pretty sure it's still available. I will check, and if it is, I will put a, a link in the description below. This is the best fix that I've ever found for it. So, this is gonna slip right in here. Bippity boppity boop. That thing ain't going nowhere. So, the first thing I'm going to do, well, coffee. Now, the second thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna take my square and my knife, and I'm gonna establish where my dado needs to be. For this, it doesn't actually matter where it is, but say I wanted my dado to be an inch down from the end of my board, I would simply measure in, take my pencil, give a little nick there, and then I would set that up. I shouldn't put my pencil in my mouth when I'm narrating something, should I? It's just so habitual. I'm gonna put my knife right in that pencil mark, just like that. Come over, slide, and score line. That's what I would do if I needed to establish uh, a certain distance away from the edge, and then I would cut my other wall away from that. However, because my second camera is right here to my right, I'm gonna do the opposite. I'm just gonna take a random distance, and I am going to mark that wall. Whew, Ooh, that was ugly. So I'm gonna mark. This is why you gotta pay attention to what you're doing with your knife. The very first knife mark I made skewed away from my square. And that's not what we want, that's not what we want at all. So even I make mistakes sometimes because I'm busy saying dumb things to camera and thinking not about what the thing I'm actually doing is. Now one thing you'll notice, rude. This knife has a bevel on both sides. You can see that there is a bevel on this side and on this side, which means when I go to cut I could potentially, if I'm straight up and down, be off of my knife wall. So I'm just gonna tilt it a little bit to the right, just a little bit, so that my bevel is actually riding my square. Now, take a few passes with that knife. I've established a good, strong knife wall. I'm gonna take my wide chisel at this point, and I'm just gonna come in from the side and just give it a little nick. Now you already may be screaming at your device, Eric, this looks an awful lot like Paul Seller's method. Yeah, because it is almost identical to Paul Seller's method, if not identical. Paul didn't invent the method, but of course he popularized the method because he's a hugely influential woodworker. And Paul was one of my very first teachers back in 2010, 2011, something like that. So I'm no stranger to Paul's method. And if you want to see Paul teach this method uh, perhaps more verbosely than I am, which kudos to him for being able to do that. You can pop over to his channel. But I'm now with my knife wall established going to slide my work piece up to that. And I'm gonna take my knife and I'm gonna give myself a nick on that side of the board. And now I've established the width of my dado. So I'm gonna take my knife again, this time being very careful not to have that knife go askew because if I do it this time, I'm not cutting into my joint, but I'm actually cutting into my work piece. So a nice light cut. And then a couple more passes. And then I can come over here and nick my knife wall on this side as well. Just like that, beautiful. What we have established is the width of our dado, but what we've not established is the depth of our dado. So, I have an itty bitty four inch double square, which happens to be one of my favorite squares. You don't need this, but it is nice to have. I'm just gonna drop that down here so that I can give myself a reference line where my walls come down just like that. And then there's a couple of different ways I can establish my depth. I can take my square and I can set it to my final depth, which in this case is gonna be one eighth of an inch. Dados don't need to be half an inch deep. 
In fact, most of the time, you don't want them to be that deep because you're actually weakening the other board that you are cutting the negative into. So I can take that at an eighth of an inch and I can make a knife wall on both sides and that would absolutely work. However, if you have a marking gauge, I'm not gonna say it's necessary for this application, but it sure is nice. I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna set this to one eighth of an inch. And now all I have to do is come across here and just mark my depth like that. Easy breezy. Now, with all of our markers set, what I need to do now is remove the material so that my other piece can fit in it. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take ye old dovetail saw and turn it into ye old dado saw. I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna set my saw right into my knife wall. Now, if you want to do the old drag cut to get it started, by all means, go for it. Live your life, cowboy. That is not how I learned. So I just, nice, light cuts. Nice and easy. Until I establish a curve. And then I can come in here and just making sure my saw stays vertical. Now, if you really want, you can set a guide here right next to the saw so that it is absolutely vertical, but you'll get good at eyeballing for vertical over time. It just takes some practice. So, I'm gonna check my walls, make sure everything looks good, and it does. Take a few swipes. And get it down to depth, beautiful. I definitely, definitely went past depth on this side, but hey, we're gonna call that the back of the cabinet. I'm gonna come over here and do the same thing. A little bit more. Beautiful, just like that. Now what this allows us to do is we've severed the fibers on both sides. So when we go to clean out this mortise, this mortise, this dado with our chisel, it's just gonna fall out. It's gonna be easy breezy. It's gonna be nice and light. So now I'm gonna take my chisel that is less than the width of my actual dado and I'm going to just start removing material. Little bit, just like that. And now I'm almost at my knife wall over here. So, just gonna go straight across my board. Hand tool work is so delightful, man. It really is. It's a, on a day like this, windows open, breeze coming in, you can hear the people going about life in the city. <sighs> it's the stuff that makes you smile. I don't wanna come out this side because I don't wanna blow those fibers out as much as I can or as much as I can avoid it, I should say. So, I can turn my board. I'm gonna be, you know what, I'm gonna be good. I'm gonna turn my board around and I'm gonna do it the proper way. To be completely frank with you guys, if it was me, I probably would have just come in from this side. But the cameras are rolling and I wanna teach good, safe habits. So, I'm gonna flip it around just for a moment. And I'm gonna come in here and do the same exact thing from the other side so that I'm coming into my cut and I'm not risking blowing out the fibers on this side. Now, once I get to this point, I wanna be careful that I'm not going downhill and I'm digging a giant trench, a big U into my dado. I want a flat dado in an ideal world, so Take my time, go nice and slow, and I'm gonna flip this back around so that my other camera can see what I'm doing. And I'm gonna come right back into my knife wall on this side, and come straight across. Beautiful, now I've got a dado. Here's the question. How do you know that your dado is at the proper depth? Because you just freehanded it. That's an excellent question. I'm so glad you asked. This is why we invented this tool.
So I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna stick it right in my dado. I'm just gonna go right across. And what I'm looking for is if I see any sunlight underneath, I know I've gone too deep. And if it's raising this up like this, then I know that I have yet to get to final depth. And that is, boy howdy is that close. If that's not perfect, it's as close to perfect as I'll ever be. So I'm just gonna take just the tiniest, tiniest shaving right out of the middle there. And now I'm gonna go in and clean out any of those extra fibers that still remain. It's another use for the wide chisel right here, is to come in and just slice like that. Glorious. Now, we shall see if this fits. And what I'm gonna do is loosen this up so that if it fits proper, it should be able to pick this up with just friction fit. Oh, that's glorious. It's a perfect dado. Real time, real time, I'm looking at it, 12 minutes and 30 seconds, and that's with the setup and the talking. It's a perfect dado. Beginner dado, easy peasy, nothing more than four tools, one of which is a pocket knife. I think you guys can handle that. I, have, I believe that you guys can knock that out, no problem. Let's move on to the intermediate. So the regular old standard through dado is simple enough, but what if you're working on a project that you don't wanna see the dado, you don't wanna see the joinery, the arts and crafts style is not really appropriate for that. Well, they invented this thing a long time ago called the stopped dado. And that's the second iteration we're gonna work on. So what we're going to do is we're gonna use the same exact tool set, it's the same exact process, except the dado is not going to go through the end of the board. We're gonna stop it a quarter of an inch short. We did say that was gonna be a stop data. I just, we're gonna leave that there as a mark of my humility. And we're gonna start again. I'm gonna come in with a square and I'm gonna mark the end of my dado just like this. I'm gonna put it right next to that one so I remember that I'm a real knucklehead sometimes. Just the knife wall or, or a pencil mark rather is gonna be good enough for right now. I'm gonna give myself a knife wall that starts at that end piece, straight across, chisel, bang. That was real silly of me, man, wasn't it? Wasn't it? I'm gonna take my work piece, give myself a width. Got a little hair in there, that's holding me out. Now one thing you can do, especially in this case, is you can just give yourself a, a nick like that, and then come in here with your knife, put your knife right in that nick, slide your square up to it, and then keep going about your business. Now I can come in here, nick the other wall, that is definitely, definitely stopped now. And then I'm gonna take either my square or my chisel, it doesn't actually matter which. And I'm just gonna put it right in there at the end. Mark where that's gonna end up and do the same thing carefully at the end of my data. Bang. Just like that, and we're good to go. I'm gonna take my marker on this side and mark my depth, and give myself a reference for that. 
Now everything is marked, everything is good, everything is clean, and is definitely, definitely stopped. But now I need to remove the material. And no problem on this side, I can just keep going. But I haven't severed my knife walls because I can't cut all the way through, and that's gonna make it a lot harder to use that saw. So instead, what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna take my chisel and I'm gonna take a heavy hitty thingy. I'm just gonna give it some taps. I'm gonna put it right in there and just tap, slide, tap, slide, tap, slide, all day long. Now this is really helpful, especially in the beginning, because it's pretty easy to tell if this chisel is vertical, right? You don't want your dado to be skewed to one side or the other, because if it tapers in, your board's never gonna fit. If it tapers out, your board's gonna be loose. So you want it to be vertical. You want it to be nice and square. The other thing you can do is just kind of eyeball for vertical and slice back and forth like this. I'll do this from time to time. But the truth is, if I'm being honest with you, and you know I always pride myself on being honest with you, I usually just do it with my knife, especially at an eighth of an inch. I'm just gonna come in here right into my knife wall and just do that once or twice. And I've gone down, I've severed enough fibers that I can come in here with my chisel and I can do the same process as I did before. And then nice and easy, straight across like that. Not all the way to the end just yet. I'm gonna leave that extra little bit there. But now I gotta come back in with my knife and sever those fibers again so I can remove them. Now the reason this is trickier, obviously, is you have to angle the knife in order to guess for 90 degrees. So it's a little trickier, but it obviously can be done. Or I shouldn't say obviously, you haven't seen if it can be done yet. You have no idea if I'm bad at this, do you? So I'm gonna come in and remove that material again right up to the edge there. God, I love a sharp chisel. I love a sharp chisel on butternut. There's something about it. It is as glorious as the day outside. Sever those fibers one more time and right into my knife wall. Straight across. I'm gonna check my depth. Actually, I'm not gonna check my depth with that. I'm gonna check my depth with this. See where we're at. Still got a little bit of material to remove. So another score. The reason it's a little bit harder to tell how much material I've removed at this point is because I only have one reference edge here. This is my only depth gauge. I have no depth gauge on this side, so I can't tell as I'm going across, if I'm flat, if I'm going uphill, if I'm going downhill, it's a little, it's trickier to tell. So you just take your time and make sure you're going about the process smoothly and accurately. Beautiful, beautiful. I'm gonna leave that as is for the moment. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start removing the little bit at the end here. Just like that. Come in and I'm just gonna press. Now butternut is soft enough where I can get away with just pressing it like that. But you may have to if you're using a denser wood, say oak or ash or cherry, you may have to come in and give it a tap with a mallet. Just depends on the species you're using. Remember, wood is not all the same. Come in here, sever those fibers. Come in here and sever the fibers on the end as well. Glorious. Give it another check for depth. And that's pretty dang close. That's pretty dang 
close. Now, I could pause it right there. I absolutely could. And I could say, I'm gonna come in as accurately and as smoothly as I can and work this down with a chisel, which for simplicity's sake, if you're working with a minimalist tool set, that will absolutely work. You just saw me do it with this, but I'm gonna introduce a new tool. If I've said it once, I've said it innumerable times. I think the most versatile hand tool in the shop. If you don't own a router plane and you want to continue to do and execute well and get better at hand tool woodworking, go buy one. Just go make the investment. So I'm gonna come in here, make sure my depth is set to one eighth of an inch. So I want it to just start to catch in my knife wall, just like that. I'm gonna come across and just bottom it out. Straight across, straight across. Maybe give it another 16th of a turn just to make sure we are where we want to be. I don't know who invented butternut, but whatever deity did, man. A kindly deity, I'm sure. It's a delightful material, truly. I'm gonna come in here, make sure that my corners are nice and square. And just like that, I've got a stopped dado. Now, this may be helpful if you're trying to set your shelf back by some distance, right? You want that back from the front of your cabinet or your shelf or whatever it is. However, however, sometimes you want that to go all the way to the front, but you wanna see that seamless look. So how are we gonna do that? Well, we gotta notch this piece as well. So I'm gonna take the same square that I have not changed the setting on. And I'm gonna give myself just a little nick on the front. Just kidding. Just think about this. So that needs to be a quarter of an inch in from the front of my piece. This is why you gotta think and not talk. So I'm gonna give myself a little notch right there. And I know that my depth was set with this. So I'm gonna come across the front of my piece, mark my depth just like that. And then give myself a mark so that I can come in here and just notch this out. So let's do that. cut very simply right off the saw. We're gonna pop our piece into our dado, slide it forward. That thing, snug as a bug in a rug, man. Stop dado. It's half a step up from the through dado, something you can absolutely accomplish probably after just practicing it just once or you've practiced it a million times like me and still forgot and went to a through dado. That's just life. Now, on to our third and final variation on this joint, the advanced version. Here's the issue with the two joints we've cut so far. If you were to cut your joinery and then surface your material, what would happen is because these joints are full width, you would remove material from the positive or the male piece and then your joint gets loose. So right now, my joint is nice and tight but if I remove material off of both faces, I'm making this board skinnier and therefore it won't be as tight. So what do you do in that situation? Well, you can do what I kind of call like the shouldered or the, the tenon dado. I don't know if it has a proper name. It probably does. Somebody on the internet's gonna yell at me. So we're gonna make that happen now. Here's what we're gonna do. We are going to figure out what size, what width dado we actually need. These pieces are about five eighths of an inch thick. I didn't actually pay attention to what the material thickness was. I was just running them through the machines. So they're five eighths of an inch thick. So I say we make a half inch wide dado. 
Therefore, we would need to take around a sixteenth of an inch off of both shoulders, off of both cheeks, in order to fit that in the dado. I think that's the move. I think that's what we're gonna do. For this one, we'll, we'll work accurately because this is a, a more advanced technique. I'm gonna say I want my dado to be one inch away from the end of my board. So I'm gonna take an inch, I'm gonna give myself a mark. I'm gonna take my square. And I'm gonna give myself a mark with a knife wall. Now, here's the thing about woodworking. Sometimes you work in awkward positions. That's just how it goes sometimes. Obviously, I would prefer not to be cutting in this awkward way with my hand, but hey, here we are, such is life. We're gonna do it and we're gonna make it work. So I've got a knife wall. Now I'm going to establish a half inch. And I'm just gonna lay a six inch rule on here and I'm gonna give myself a mark at half an inch. And I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna mark my other wall. Put my knife right in there. Do one of those. And do one of those. Now you might be screaming at your, your television set, as it were, saying, Eric, there's no way that's a perfect half inch. You marked it with a pencil, you eyeballed it, and then you just came in with a knife and cut it. Well, yeah, but it's a nominal half inch. Now here's the thing, if I'm making 50 of these joints, I'm probably gonna set that up more accurately because I wanna work as efficiently as I can. But if I'm making one of these joints and I'm fitting my positive piece to my negative piece, I don't care if that joint's exactly a half inch. I don't care if it's a half a millimeter above or below because I'm going to fit my positive to my negative every time. This is when you take apart old furniture and you look at them, they're often marked with Roman numerals to tell you which joint goes where because each joint, even though they're the same joint, is ever so slightly different because of the nature of cutting things with hand tools. So. No, it's not exactly a half inch. I'm not gonna take out a, a brass spacer and make sure that it is an exact half inch because I don't care. That's a waste of time with the method that we are doing. Working one at a time, working with hand tools. So now I've got those established. I'm gonna go through my same process as before. Give it the old Nikaruski. Sometimes I say things and then I hear them after I say them and I realize that I'm an idiot. from one side, from the other side, and bada bing, bada boom, bam! Got a perfect dado at a half an inch. So my depth is beautiful, but of course that ain't gonna fit because I need to remove material off of there. So how are we gonna do that? Well, super simple. I have my depth set from my gauge, and all I need to do is take this, and go straight across my piece. And I know exactly how deep I need to go with that shoulder. But what I don't know is how far in I need to go with my shoulder. So we need to figure that out. We need to do a little bit of math real quick. And who does math anymore? Where's my measuring device? I've got that's, that's pretty close to exactly a half inch. And I have, if I'm being accurate with my measurements, five eighths, 10, 20, I've got 1930 seconds on here, because of course I do, which means I need to remove 330 seconds, which means I need to remove 360 fourths off of both sides. Why do I make my life more complicated than it needs to be? I don't know, we'll never know. But what I am gonna do is I'm gonna take my depth gauge now that I no longer need this depth because I have marked that out. I'm going to reset this to 360 fourths. We don't have time to do that kind of math. So I'm gonna come in here and I'm going to mark that like so. And then I'm just gonna look. I'm gonna see if that looks right. That looks beautiful. That looks beautiful. What I need to do now is remove that material, very simply. So let's go over to my vise. So I've got this thing queued up. What I'm going to do 
is just deep in my knife wall ever so slightly. This, this is so shallow that it's literally already severing the fibers at the depth of cut, but that is all right. I'm just gonna do that. And then you can do this with a chisel or you can do this with a router plane. Really entirely up to you what you have available to you and how you prefer to work. And I'm just gonna ever so slightly and ever so slowly start to pop that material off just like that. Now, I'm not going to go too far. I'm gonna be very conservative with this because I wanna test fit it to see if it's actually getting to the depth that I need and want. You can hear those five or seven. I mean, it's just popping off. Beautiful. Now, let's give this a test fit. Oh yeah, oh, oh yeah, that's glorious. That's it, I mean, that's the, that's the whole thing. Now, is this a little bit looser than I would prefer it to be? Absolutely, but is it tight enough where when I glue that up, it's gonna be a-okay? More than tight enough, it's, it's beautiful. So if you get to a point and you're in that process of cutting your joinery and you go, oh my God, it's too, it's never gonna, Guys, that's good enough. That's good enough, dog. In taking apart old furniture as I was learning this trade and trying to figure this out, I saw joints that were way worse than that and they lasted well over 100 years. So it's gonna be just fine. So that's the advanced version of this joint, something that you can do to avoid having the issue of surfacing your pieces and loosening that joint up. And again, if you throw a stop on here the same way we did on this end, that's gonna close up and that's gonna give you three shoulders so nobody's ever gonna see that joint there. That's also a big deal if there is a little bit of an error, if you're using your tools and you just like bruise a shoulder or goof it up somehow, those shoulders are gonna hide that error and that's why I always put shoulders on my joints. That's hand cut joinery, y'all. So, that's that, friends. A very simple application, a very simple process using, at most, six tools i'm not really going to count a knife so if we don't count that five tools plus some kind of clamping system or holding system and for what it's worth if you don't have a tail vise you can probably just use double stick tape it's more expensive over the long run but if you're just starting out and all you have is like a slab uh, door workbench situation grab some double stick tape or grab some clamps like f clamps and figure out a clamping solution there are alternatives that you can do pretty cheaply so that's that i hope this was helpful i hope it was enjoyable i know i certainly enjoy on, again on a day like today just listening to the sounds of the city having the windows open taking a quiet moment turning the music off and just being present with the material and the process is something that i deeply enjoy and if it's the way you enjoy working as well then i hope this was something that you'll take away and be able to apply to your practice if not friends I hope you learned something because I am also of the opinion that if you only know machines and if you only know hand tools, you are limited by both of those skill sets. The best craftsmen in the world, hands down, are the ones who can do both fluently, who can speak both languages equally efficiently, and they have opened up a world of opportunity because they are limited by neither. So I hope it was helpful. And I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you get in the shop and go make a thing. If you want to support me over on Patreon, you can go do that. I'll leave a link down below, or go pick up some merch for yourself. You can support my channel that way as well. I appreciate you either way, or if you just come and visit every Saturday for a watch, that's totally fine too. So go get in the shop, go make a thing, go try to enjoy it, and I'll see you all next week. Cheers. Cheers.